Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us today at um, one of the uh, Digital Agenda Schools Club Management webinar series. Today, uh, I'm being joined by Radek Orszawski and he will talk to us about discovering upstream Kanban. Um, all of the questions will be handled after the webinar, so please, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A session. Uh, the section and the box is at the below of your screen. So Radek, whenever you are ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe just a, 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 as a word of comments, uh, please uh, please put your questions when you have them, because I guess we will see them as as the host and, and uh, yes. panelists. So um, if there's going to be any question related to the content that you're going to see, maybe the terms that I'm going to speak about, um, I know that we are not fully fully interactive in the uh, uh, like a webinar mode, uh, but I will try to answer or maybe refer to some of them uh, on the fly. If the questions will be more complex or or maybe more general, um, as uh, Anna said, we will try to answer all of them or as many of, as possible of them uh, by the end of um, of our meeting today. Uh, so yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, depending on your uh, yeah time zone or or time of the day, good morning or good afternoon or good evening. Uh, today, the topic of our meeting is uh, discovering the upstream Kanban. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, you maybe heard this word, uh, definitely word heard Kanban. So we're going to talk about what is special about upstream. What is it, first of all, and what is special about it in terms of um, how to build it, in terms of um, how to work with it. Uh, of course, the topic is much uh, broader than what I'm going to present uh, to you today. Uh, but yeah, we need to start with something. And as Anya said, this is the, uh, let's just say, intro level um, uh, webinar. So we don't expect any uh, upfront knowledge. And of course, we don't cover all the all the details. OK, so let's, uh, let's roll. Um, the first thing is that, uh, yeah, if we develop uh, products, if we build uh, digital products or maybe hardware and, and, and digital um, products, we very often have a lot of ideas. We have also ideas for building businesses, maybe for sales or uh, marketing um, uh, departments. It doesn't need to be just uh, building software. And we say that ideas are cheap. What does it mean? We can have uh, lots of ideas relatively quickly and we gather this these topics, these uh, requests, uh, our own ideas, uh, maybe ideas from our stakeholders, directly from our customers, um, and we put them somewhere, right? Today, uh, we put them into many digital tools. Um, we put them into tickets on some uh, some boards, uh, into some lists, etc. Uh, the case is that the ideas uh, do not age well. So ideas are not like the, the bottles of wine, which are getting more, I would say, <laughs> value over time or hopefully value or, or even, uh, yeah, sometimes economical value. Uh, they, they are not even this, you know, composter. So like uh, we, we put uh, maybe, you know, leftovers of food or leaves and grass. And over the time we have something uh, valuable, like, uh, you know, good uh, fertilizer for, uh, <laughs> for our garden. Um, and unfortunately, if we look at the ideas, uh, they don't age well in none of these uh, ways. Uh, what they usually look like uh, is something like this. We have a cluttered garage. I don't know if you have one. Uh, I, I would say uh, periodically do have <laughs> cluttered garage. And if you don't even have a garage, you probably have like a cupboard in your kitchen, uh, which is this, uh, you know, Let's let's be honest. Uh, junkyard for the things that oh I'm gonna need it. I'm gonna use it one day. Uh, oh, this is something that I haven't seen for years, but I'm not gonna let it go. I will keep it for later because later I will definitely have time to uh, you know start the hobby that you thought about or maybe the special type of cooking for which you have the utensils or whatever else. Um, and uh, the same applies to, to the knowledge work, the same applies to ideas, the same applies to opportunities uh, that we could have uh, for our businesses. Um, and uh, we very often, uh, for anyone who comes from the, yeah, let's just say agile uh, environment, movement, however you call it, uh, we put these ideas into things which are called product backlogs. 
Um, product backlog is not a new idea, although the definition of product backlog, as we understand it from the, um, the Scrum Guide, where it's been like, I would say, formally uh, identified, uh, is, is evolving. And uh, I allowed myself to make a copy of uh, current edition of the uh, Scrum Guide, who says that the product backlog is the emergent ordered list of what is needed to improve the product. This could be new ideas, this could be improvements to existing elements of the product and so on. Um, and uh, I would say, yeah, in many organizations which are uh, working uh, in a smart, agile way or organization who only declare that they do it this way, uh, we very often see these backlogs. So like this is a very common legacy uh, word in vocabulary of many organizations. Now, the problem is that uh, the backlog, as it's, uh, I would say, maintained in many organizations, uh, is not as great idea as it may sound. And I want to be precise that uh, I'm not, um, not, not, I don't have intention to, to start a flame war against this definition. I just uh, highlight uh, some ideas which are definitely good and which are uh, risky to, to manage in this definition. So the first word is emergent. We're gonna uh, talk about this word. What does it mean, emergent? If you are not a native English speaker, like I am, uh, like I'm, I'm not. So I am. Yeah, like uh, depending, like how you see it. Um, it may you may imagine different things under word emergent. So let's let's talk about it. Uh, the the second uh, is that um, the backlog should be, I would say, the subject of refining activities, uh, which is also great. We're gonna talk about it. Um, more uh, risky thing is that the backlog should be ordered. And of course, when we say ordered, we uh, we understand that there should be some sequence of the um, actions or opportunities, uh, maybe tasks. Um, and uh, sometimes it's not easy. Uh, whoever was in a position of a product owner or a project uh, product manager, uh, maybe a scrum master or the agile coach or a product manager supporting uh, product people, uh, they know that uh, very often uh, this is, let's just say, majority of their uh, daily work <laughs> to uh, to order the um, the backlog. So we're going to talk about it. What uh, what does it mean, or what challenges are are related to it? And then we have this word, which I um, highlighted in red, which is a singular form of a word list. So lists are good. On the other hand, they can be intimidating. They can be overwhelming. Um, so, so sometimes we see problems with lists. And again, we're going to elaborate uh, on it uh, in details in a moment. Um, and of course, uh, what is also uh, risky to say that everything what is in the product backlog is needed uh, because, well, maybe we needed this part of, uh, you know, um, I don't know, kitchen tools or equipment some years ago, uh, but it, is it really needed now? And I would say the same rules apply to the knowledge work, the same rules apply to um, ideas. Uh, something that's been initially needed, something that was really hot and wanted, uh, doesn't need to be this way after uh, many months or even years. And we know from I would say, uh, yeah, let's just say uh, observations in many organizations that sometimes the items in the backlog are uh, extremely old. Um, okay, so let's move on. Let's uh, focus on these words, uh, emergent. Emergent means that, uh, well, um, what is, it? it's, it's, it's living being, right? So we know that uh, uh, it's not like we have all the ideas initially there. And uh, if we compare the, 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 let's just say, view of the backlog in January and several weeks later, it may look differently. Some of the items will be already delivered. Some of the items will be reshuffled. Maybe new ideas will be added. And as you can see, the backlog on March is longer than it was on January. Uh, that's, I would say, the nature of our work. The second uh, word, ordered, uh, basically, in, I would say instantly triggers a question order by what. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what you what you have in your mind. Uh, what is the factor? What is the value that you would uh, order your ideas by? Uh, and I very often hear, of course, it should be ordered by value. Well, 
Um, I would challenge that saying that it's, it's ordered by hypothetical value because as long as we don't deliver something, it's just our hypothesis. It's our assumption that uh, you know, users, customers, stakeholders will love it, that it will convert, that it will bring more users or more money uh, or more fame or more of market share or, or, or whatever else. Um, still, we could try to order the list by the hypothetical value. Uh, but sometimes we know that hypothetical value is not equal one-to-one -to, -one to urgency. So for example, we could have hypothetically valuable item, which is the blue one on the top. But unfortunately, in order to keep our operations, uh, we need to be compliant with some new regulatory uh, requirement. And this re uh, requirement is um, valid as of, I don't know, 1st of May. It's like tomorrow? No, I guess uh, weekend, yeah? So. Yeah, quickly, quickly, we need to do uh, some other items before we will switch to the most valuable for us. So uh, we could reshuffle the backlog uh, by the urgency, and then we are in this kind of, uh, you know, problem. What do we do first? Uh, and of course, uh, there are many, many dimensions, many factors that you could consider. What I'm going to talk about is just three. The third one is the readiness to be worked on. So uh, maybe uh, if we order by whatever items are after this refinement activity, uh, these are different items than we would see on the top of the backlog, which is ordered by hypothetical value or urgency. Of course, one could say, yeah, if, uh, if we want to work on the one which is uh, you know, most valuable, maybe we should work on it, um, which is true, but maybe that's a totally new item while some days or weeks ago, we already invested some time in splitting, slicing, um, uh, scoping, descoping, whatever activities are uh, involved in the refinement or preparation here. So as I said, this is majority of what <laughs> uh, takes um, um, from the product owner or product manager's um, uh, daily work to make sure that the items are ready, that they are uh, ordered in a right sequence. Although whoever worked with one dimensional lists know that it's challenging. Uh, what do I mean? I again will uh, refer to like everyday examples. And uh, if you ever uh, looked for flights, maybe not uh, direct flights, but maybe like connecting flights, uh, have, having like two or three legs flight, we know that looking for a flight between two cities can be also, um, yeah, a reason for a headache. Why? Because of course, just like in a backlog, we could order the list of possible connections by multiple factors, maybe sorted by price and by price ascending, descending, maybe by the duration of the flight, maybe by the alliance uh, in which we uh, collect our miles yeah, and we want to keep our whatever senator status or something like this. Maybe by the number of stopovers, uh, because we, we don't want to have uh, too much time or, or uh, risky short connection time at the airport. So uh, we know that uh, what we see in the websites offering the um, uh, flight search or in the websites offering, for example, I don't know, even clothes, um, e-commerce e shops, sometimes what we can do is like filter them. Uh, and, and filtering, of course, of course, helps to a certain degree. But the problem is that every time we reorder or every time we apply a filter, we lose part of the information, right? We don't see some of the items. And uh, yeah, it's it's even hard for us, like cognitively, to 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 you know remember what we have seen a moment ago, and compare. Okay, what is the cheapest one and its duration versus the shortest one and its price? Yeah, like. If, if we switch these views, I mean, this, this can be really a, a reason for a headache. So um, what, we, what we say that the product backlog was supposed to be, as Scrum practitioners say, ac accessible and transparent and understandable. I guess these are the, the things which basically, or the, or the words which were used, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in one of the past uh, Scrum uh, guide uh, definitions or, or editions. Uh, but uh, I allowed myself to create a meme for this opportunity. So you were supposed to bring the transparency that your product backlog, yet you became one more cluttered garage. Yeah. So it's <laughs> it's not a uh, it's not as easy to work with it as 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 we hope it's gonna uh, be.
Okay, so uh, for last maybe 10 minutes or more, I've been talking about challenges of working with the product backlogs and lots of ideas. I hope that you have found some of these ideas resonating with your life or life of professional life or challenges of your colleagues. So question is, okay, uh, so what could we do instead? And this is the moment where we enter the area of uh, upstream Kanban. Uh, so a solution uh, which could, uh, I would say, solve some of the problems that we have discussed uh, in, in yeah past minutes. So uh, yeah, uh, let's let's try to discover where these items, where these work items are coming from. So uh, as we said, could be uh, stakeholders, could be the team, could be the product owner, him or herself, and so on. Uh, so questions like what is happening before something lands on our regular Kanban or on Scrum board, which is, uh, you know, um, starting with this next column, right? So we know that there is something on the uh, left-hand side, but we are wondering uh, where do they come from? Like what's, what's, what's to the left from the arrow that you see? So uh, yeah, who brings it? It could be product owner, it could be the customers directly. I mean, different setups, uh, this could mean different things. Again, we are not focusing on the um, software development only, uh, but on all type of knowledge work. So this could be, I don't know, legal services or maybe design or marketing or recruitment uh, team, uh, which is basically uh, you know, uh, fed by hiring managers inside the organization. Um, so this could be a product owner, this could be different sources, uh, we would put the product backlog next to the board, we very often hide it from the board because as I said, you know, looking at uh, the list full of, you know, tens of items um, could be could be really overwhelming, could be really uh, putting uh, unhealthy psychological pressure, also even from your practical perspective, like scrolling up and down the list with like a thousand items, uh, that could be a problem. Uh, believe me, two, two weeks ago, I've seen a board with like 20 to uh, 10, 20, 1,020 tickets on the left. Yeah, that wasn't loading fast and it wasn't easy to <laughs> scroll down. Um, so so maybe that wasn't the wisest idea to, to show it on the same board. And the question is, okay, if we if we have the first answer that these items are brought to us by the product owner, by the customers, by the project manager, whoever, then questions like where does she take them from? Yeah, because uh, it's it's rarely that one person is the source of all of these items, um, and this is the first time that we show to you the concept, which is basically extending what we see usually on our operational, our delivery board to the left, and uh, in the Kanban, uh, let's just say uh, vocabulary or or dictionary, we very often call this this. The, the board that we start with downstream or delivery Kanban, while we say that on the left, there is maybe sometimes uh, should be something that we call either upstream or discovery Kanban. Uh, I entitled today the workshop Discovering the Upstream Kanban, which is of course some kind of uh, you know word game. Uh, you may find uh, different sources using two different names, uh, but what is really important here is that we would like to see, because if you probably know Kanban is about visualization or using visualization, um, what is going on between the options and the moment when we uh, decide to exercise them. Exercise or realize, depending like uh, what kind of uh, language you use. Um, options is something that you may know also from the economics, uh, that you may buy the options uh, to, uh, to do some action. You may exercise them, you, you may realize them. Uh, you can put them on a shelf, um, ideally not to just keep them, but to acquire more knowledge. Uh, this is what we very often do in the product development, that we say, hmm, this idea still looks, uh, let's just say, uh, interesting enough to, to keep it, uh, but we could uh, decide uh, or we should decide if it's uh, worth uh, executing or worth exercising if we uh, know something, uh, something more about it, yeah? Okay, uh, and of course, uh, what uh, what would uh, I I, re I rephrase it? If if we would reject many options, we wouldn't have so much uh, cluttered cupboards or garages or product backlogs, right? So we know from the um, behavioral economics that uh, there is this thing which is called 
you know loss aversion so we are we are we feel attached we feel emotional attached to our ideas especially our ideas uh because they are usually great in our perception so it's really hard to reject it okay uh what uh, what, uh, what 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 would be the steps to basically build such upstream kanban uh i again put uh, here the word sprint backlog also to refer it that it's fully applicable to people who uh, work in organizations using scrum i know that in scrum guide it says like it should be a list but uh, i would say one of the wonders of upstream kanban it's a huge huge help for uh, product owners busy all the time shuffling and filtering the one-dimensional list. So if you work in Scrum, it could be a sprint backlog. If you work in any other way, it could be the, the list, a subset of next items to do. Um, and we say probably something what is on the left from next are items to work on. We usually have more items to work on than we decide to pull, than decide to, to start next. So maybe the, le the, the li list on the left, I'm sorry, is a little bit longer. Uh, but we should ask a question, what happens before we have items ready to work on? Well, again, if you use the Scrum vocabulary, you could say refinements. Some people would say business analysis. Some people would say system analysis, maybe both. It doesn't really matter. This is just an example. Don't take it that you know these are precise steps. Um, because again, if we would refer to um, recruitment process, and honestly, I have like really great examples of applying upstream Kanban to recruitment um, teams on in, re in recruitment teams. Um, we could say, oh, this is a screening of the company uh, of of the candidates, yeah, or something like this. Um, so, okay, what happens before it's refined? Oh, maybe we uh, receive a big uh, requirement that we slice, uh, which is too big because we say it's, it wouldn't be agile, it wouldn't be safe, it wouldn't be even feasible to work on this big item. So maybe we will take some be something bigger and, and slice it into smaller items. Okay, where do the big items are coming from? Yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe we have, I don't know, safe PI planning. So every three months we, we do uh, a big replenishment, a big planning. Maybe we have uh, a roadmap and maybe we have OKRs and these are the you know next quarter goals or, or, or something like this. Yeah. So we could say, uh, depending, of, uh, depending on what you have as a way of working, again, it's very, I would say universal, very flexible. Uh, you may find, uh, yeah, or you may discover uh, pretty much uh, interesting uh, things happening here. And I wish, I strongly wish uh, that you in the end find that maybe the, the source of it are real customers. So someone called and say, I would like to have this feature in, in your product or have you thought about this or that? Uh, but we know that sometimes it changes. Sometimes it's, um, again, uh, regulators, uh, different regulatory bodies, especially if you work in, I don't know, financial sector or insurance or telco, pharma, you, you have some uh, regulations that you need to be uh, compliant with. Uh, maybe what you put into your upstream is reaction to what competitors do. Yeah, I guess the big, big thing last uh, weeks, if not months already, is the chat GPT and AI. And I'm pretty sure that <laughs> on roadmaps or backlogs of multiple products, maybe even the one that you work with uh, or work on, um, you you say, oh, they they already announced that they do the AI integration, so must we do? Okay. Uh, and of course, sometimes it's the sales or key account people um, because you have, I don't know, B2B um, relation to your customer uh, or whatever else is here, right? We say it, it should, first of all, reflect your specific context. Uh, so it, it shouldn't be thought like, okay, there are like five steps because Radek showed five steps. No, it, it, it should be basically discovering. That's why we entitled this, this webinar today this way. Where is the work coming from? Okay, so what is next? We say we understand a little bit better uh, where is the work coming from. We call it uh, like your sources of demand, so uh, whatever it would be. Um, and uh, now the question is like, like how to build uh, or start building it. So again, in every work system, every Kanban system for sure, we uh, identify something what we call the point of commitment. 
I know that the word of word commitment has different meaning again for non native English speakers or yeah, people who read scrum guide 10 years ago and now <laughs> the, the word commitment may mean different things. Um, but we say in Kanban that whatever goes through the point of commitment is something that now we want to focus on right. Um, and uh, because of that, we say that uh, usually a good uh, border uh, between the upstream and downstream Kanban is this point of commitment. This point of commitment, uh, which says, yes, we have multiple sources. Yes, we have uh, some big cadence, some big uh, um, maybe frequency, uh, longer frequency that we, we plan our work. Um, that we then slice it, refine it, uh, prepare for work. Uh, but here, uh, neck or like below this this orange arrow, this is the moment when we say now. Now is the time to implement it. Now is the time to start the delivery of it. Uh, I highlighted here words now and focus because I, I would say these are two important words in here. Uh, but I would say building the upstream is also important because we very often see uh, that the initial, let's just say, design, initial way that we build this um, this flow uh, is uh, maybe not full picture. What do I mean? So um, first of all, it's interesting to understand that maybe the items crossing the orange uh, arrow place are basically something that we say now. Uh, but who and when says yes. And we very often discover that the, the statement, yes, we're going to do it, is, for example, yeah, I'm ironing, uh, a little bit ironic here, like SVP of disruption, uh, who two months earlier said, yes, maybe a salesperson promised uh, something to the customers uh, already. Uh, maybe the regulatory body already decided the date upfront and uh, we, we really uh, don't say yes or no here, because yes or no was already said before, uh, this point of commitment, which is like, you know, uh, separating uh, these two type of, uh, these two, two elements of flow um, are basically just saying now, because the yes was already said before. And again, uh, this could be a very interesting uh, and important uh, discovery for many organizations, because we very often see this kind of dissatisfaction between the delivery organization and uh, business organization. If you if you use this kind of separation, uh, why? Because well, the delivery teams have a feeling like we said yes to it maybe two weeks ago, uh, and we deliver it with a relatively good uh, delivery time or lead time, uh, while the customer or upper management are unhappy. And why? Because they already started counting the time from the moment that they said yes, or they were told to do it by the regulatory body. So it's uh, it's also helpful uh, because I guess then we have then we could have like a meaningful conversation. Uh, is it is it good setup that we say yes here and now later? Um, as I said, sometimes it's not a full picture because we say, oh, yeah, but what we have uh, identified and what we have visualized so far is only the new requirements. But because our product is live, we sometimes requ uh, require some bug reports and, and we have like additional stream of work coming here. Uh, again, sometimes and again, we don't judge it. We just observe it. Uh, there is like, you know, helicopter running <laughs> above the, the whole system with the CEO on board who, who drops some uh, yeah really disruptive work and and basically tries to cut the queue, cut the line and, and enter the system uh, from you know some kind of side. Uh, sometimes it's justified, sometimes it's a big business opportunity, but sometimes these kind of interruptions are basically very yeah uh, disruptive to to predictability of, of the business. So we should be really, um, aware, uh, I mean, again, start with visualizing this, that there is actually something more than we uh, imagined, I would say, uh, initially in the first exercise, first approach uh, to, to map our um, upstream work. Um, okay, so now I would like to uh, move to the third part of our uh, meeting today, which is how to work with the upstream. Uh, because I, I, I hope that by now you understand that upstream is pretty much everything, um, uh, everything what is uh, to the left from your execution, delivery, operational board. 
and uh, you should basically do the discovery phase for yourself yeah so uh that that should be uh something that that we understand uh yeah that we build with our businesses with our teams we we don't copy the solution just like we shouldn't copy the downstream boards i see one question um that uh, yeah does it have to be two different boards uh well that's a very good question before we move forward um i would say it really depends on what do you start with. I'm a huge fan of, first of all, having this workflow end-to-end -end, uh, in the same tracking tool, in the same project inside the tracking tool, and so on. I will explain in a moment why. Uh, the, the first reason is like understanding like what is the age and what is the speed of the items across the board. Although I understand that sometimes we say, yeah, looking at such a wide board would be uh, really not uh, not really easy. So I would say what is important that it's one workflow. If we have two different boards or maybe even three three boards, uh, yeah, maybe one combining one um, one um, uh, yeah uh, co combining both one for the upstream one for the downstream that different groups mostly look at different boards that's that's i would say the uh yeah uh, this is the work in the trenches like how how we sort it out um yeah but thank you for thank you for the uh, question uh, so coming back to the third part of our meeting today how to work with the upstream so uh, again it is i would say kanban system or we aim to have it as a kanban system so we probably uh, apply some practices that you know if you are like uh, familiar with uh, the very basics of kanban even um but there are some twists and turns which are i would say more specific for uh, for upstream kanban so first of all, uh, two phases of the WIP limits, work in progress limits, right? We say that we uh, accomplish focus by uh, applying work in progress uh, limits on the fact that we don't want to start too many things at the same, same time. Um, and uh, therefore, on many Kanban uh, systems, we see these numbers, which are on top of the columns, which are saying there should be no, four, no more than four tickets here and no more than three tickets in here. And now if we uh, build, I would say the upstream um, board or the funnel, which is like leading uh, to, um, to the downstream board, we very often see two different type of whip limits here. Uh, the maximum whip limits, which are here visualized with the red numbers, and also the minimum whip limits, uh, which are visualized with the green numbers. So um, what is new and, and why would we use the minimum whip limits here? Um, I would say uh, it warns us uh, that, for example, there is a missing uh, missing work. Uh, I see uh, someone just posted a question saying, I'm a Scrum Master, so let's refer to Scrum Reality. Uh, if you are about to start a new sprint, and this sprint will be visualized on the downstream board, uh, and you are missing, you have very low number of items that went through the refinement, this is a warning, right? our future sprint, our future period of work or the work on the items uh, that we see uh, to the left from the board, even if you don't have sprints, may be risky because we haven't discussed it. We haven't, um, you know, um, yeah, uh, discussed, sliced, uh, forecasted if you need the items, categorized them and so on. Uh, so we have the situation that the, the, the number uh, in green uh, like, you know, going below the number in green uh, basically sends us some kind of um, some kind of message that, hey, we may soon be lacking the, the good quality and needed job. Um, what is also related to it is that uh, we may observe problems with sustainable pace of work of this whole organization, not only upstream or downstream, because they should be playing to the same uh, goal. Uh, but basically, if we see that, for example, the work on the upstream is relatively slow, it takes weeks to deliver something, to go from the option or idea or a customer request before it's really refined, defined to, to work on it. Um, and what is even worse, we see that this work is is, is move, moving by uh, through this board in big packages. So we could imagine that there are like 10 tickets here, moving completely 10 tickets here and so on. Um, while our delivery team is a super fast 
jet fighter, right? I, I put like a container ship here and a fighter here. Uh, so we know that our de delivery team is actually capable of delivering a single item relatively quick. Then we have a problem. I'm, I mean, we can, yeah, we could discuss like what kind of problems we could have in here, uh, but definitely it is uh, dangerous. And um, very often people see that, okay, so we extend the board from left to, to right, that it's really wide. And they are afraid that, oh, it means like we go to the waterfall times. Well, um, I would say, please bear in mind that the, the fact that, that the items are moving linearly through the upstream and downstream board doesn't need to mean that it's waterfallish. What would be the, I would say, a sign of water in the waterfallish is, is working in big batches. So the fact that I described a moment ago that we don't see single items moving through the boards, but we see big packages of items, yeah, uh, moving from uh, from one to the left uh, before, um, uh, yeah, maybe all of them need to be analyzed before they move to refinement, all of them need to be refined and so on, yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, again, we should uh, observe as you probably know, Kanban is very much in love with data. So we should also observe the speed of moving uh, and the, pack the size of the packages, uh, the time that it goes to go across the board. Uh, because uh, yeah, if we have this, I would say mismatch between the speeds. Yeah, uh, when the delivery teams have nothing to work on, we very often um, see that they are given low quality, uh, not really needed, uh, not uh, cheaply verified ideas to work on, just to keep them busy. Yeah, which is uh, which is dangerous, which is wait wasteful, um, which is economically not uh, not correct. Um, okay, what's uh, yeah? What should be uh, what what we should have our radar on is like, do we see the big batches moving? Because this is the size of uh, this is the sign of um, let's just say. Um, yeah, um, waterfall approach. I see now uh, a big avalanche of uh, questions. We'll try to re answer them um, a little bit later. Um, so yeah, what are other techniques? I mean, first of all, just like for the downstream uh, board, it would be good to identify and introduce as active and passive steps, columns or statuses, as you, as, uh, uh, however you call it on the upstream. Uh, I allowed myself to, to visualize the active with green and uh, the passive with yellow. Why? Because we know that the people who are working on the upstream do not work continuously end-to-end -end on the item from left to right. Um, product owner, product managers, analysts, they usually work on the item, then put it on a yeah some kind of uh, waiting status uh, before either themselves come back to it later, or maybe another person will be involved. And uh, visualizing this way can also give us the feeling, not only feeling, but also the data. Um, yeah, how much actually is taking the active work on the items versus the, the waiting time between, uh, you know, one person and receiving a feedback from another one or handing over to another person and so on. Um, I put some dots in here on this uh, boards, uh, on, on these tickets. Uh, as you know, some of the tools are using the dots to show the aging of the ticket. So again, if we put them into the yellow uh, passive column and we see that this item has no dots, then we know that it's relatively fresh in here. It's relatively new. While some other of the tasks are actually spent already, you know, multiple days, if not weeks in here. So uh, visualizing this uh, not only with active, but also passive statuses can show us either the flow or a lack of flow of the items. Um, additionally, uh, I, as I said, well, the traditionally perceived product backlog is something that we see as one dimensional list. If we have these uh, passive and active statuses, uh, we automatically add one more direct di dimension per column. Uh, so, of course, if you are the person working in this status and your colleague is working on this status, by formulating the queue between you, by tracking the web page, by ordering the items in here, you can much easier uh, give a signal which item should be pulled next by the next uh, person or maybe by you later when you have time to take care of the, the next steps. Um, yeah. 
very often we see that some items are like you know flowing around the items which are like aging uh, we we started our our webinar today with with talking about aging so we don't want to go this way uh we could visualize something that i called like a depth of the flow and decide uh, what do we do with it okay uh, what's next is, uh, yeah, do we drop anything? As I said, we very often feel, I would say, emotionally attached to uh, the items. We very often are afraid that uh, there's going to be like a big consequence if we drop an idea. Uh, although we say it's healthy, uh, we should uh, drop some of the items, especially older items, outdated items. Um, items that we verified quickly that they are not as promising as we initially say, uh, thought about. And uh, how we call it in the Kanban world is a discard rate. So we should uh, either track the number of items that we drop in a period of time or the ratio, like what, what's the percentage of the items that uh, do not go uh, across the full upstream because they are discarded. Um, yeah, I would say if we don't drop enough or, or if we don't drop at all, there are like, I would say, at least two uh, possible reasons. We either have only good ideas and I don't know any company who has only good ideas, um, or maybe uh, we don't uh, validate them there uh, cheap enough and we let them go through the upstream uh, to the downstream. And we know that this is a really expensive part and only after investing the expensive um, downstream effort, we discover that, hey, this is something that is uh, really, uh, yeah, could be, I would say, validated uh, upfront, um, yeah, and 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 see uh, see it earlier uh, without investing so much time and and, and money. Uh, one of the techniques uh, which, uh, yeah, our host today, Anna, probably likes very much is the time guillotine. When we say, when we really spread the backlogs into the uh, upstream uh, Kanban boards and we observe how old are the items, we come to conclusions that some of the items are really extremely old. I mean, in my case, it was, uh, you know, cases where we had uh, items old in years and no one in the organization really knew. Why, why is it there? The, the person who, who you know, uh, requested these items uh, were not uh, even working there anymore. So it was super hard. And we say, maybe we should introduce a time guillotine algorithm or approach that, for example, the items, especially in the waiting uh, statuses, should not spend more than X. I put like 30 here, and I didn't say 30 days or 30 weeks or 30 months. I mean, I just wanted to say like, there should be a cut off, like some kind of threshold. And we say, if it's there longer than 30, whatever the unit of time you have, maybe sprints, maybe days, we should drop it. And uh, we should, uh, again, analyze what is dropped. Is it something that we have actively rejected? Or is it something that was dropped automatically by this time guillotine? Again, I know that it's like psychologically very hard to implement, but uh, yeah. I, I I I feel like I don't need to convince you that you probably uh, know that it would be very helpful for uh, super long backlogs. Um, okay, what else? Um, as I said, sometimes we discover that we have different sources of work, different uh, types of work going through the um, upstream. And again, a good technique is, of course, to visualize them maybe with a color coding. So here I applied like different colors for the new features, which are yellow, for the technical depth items, which are purple, maybe for items uh, related to scaling, scaling the technology. Um, and I see one of the questions in the chat about uh, visualizing spikes. If you have a, a flow of spikes, so some kind of uh, initiatives where you work before you commit to it because you do the proof, proof of concept or you want to understand, is it something that, uh, that you know, we just want to give a certain time box and after the time box decide, is, does it go further or not? Uh, I would say that's a, that's a good uh, opportunity to visualize it as well. And uh, yeah, I would say you could put the spikes on the downstream. I would also see the space for the um, for, for the spikes on the upstream side. Uh, if you remember the the picture that we have seen some months, some minutes ago, uh, maybe you could have a swim lane for the bug fixes, right? So uh, whatever is in your 
um, your system. Again, referring to maybe recruitment story, uh, we could see the you know new positions versus rehiring. So you know replacing people who left. Uh, yeah, that that could be totally different. Uh, a context in terms of what is visualized in the swim lanes or what is visualized with different color code, it should be your design. So we should visualize the work streams. Mm, and uh, what comes next is maybe once we see it, we should allocate our bandwidth. What I mean by bandwidth is our focus, our time, our resources. Um, maybe you want to focus on existing product, which would be yellow here, but maybe we also want to make sure that we invest some time uh, again, by my minimum whip limits into so you know innovation work or something like this. Yeah, so uh, this could be uh, this could be one approach. Uh, again, we could say it shouldn't be more than six in this swim lane, but never fewer than four. Yeah, that's, that's just an example of applying the minimum and maximum uh, whip limits not per column by per swim lane. Um, what else? Um, what I already said, and this is the last uh, way of working with upstream, is that we very often see uh, or hear statements that it's very waterfallish, that it's like you know business versus IT and so on. I I think what uh, building the healthy upstream and downstream and healthy connected uh, systems allows us to observe and influence engagement. What what, what do I mean by that? We usually naturally have people in the organizations who mostly focus on ideas and concepts, business people, salespeople, designers, uh, analysts, product owners. And it would be uh, unnatural to say that they are also always involved in the delivery. No, we usually also have people who mainly focus on the delivery, software engineers, recruiters, designers, graphics, whoever. And it would be good to see, for example, where I, I made a sunrise here. Where does the item appears on the horizon of the people who are focused mainly on the delivery? If it's very close to the delivery board, well, that's probably too late. We probably lost the opportunity to hear them out and uh, basically, yeah, involve them, engage them into work uh, collaboratively on it. Uh, so what I allowed myself to do with the color uh, here is that, of course, the, the, the blue part of the delivery people are like mostly involved here, but we should observe where is this horizon, where is the sunrise here, where is the first status that they are involved in it. And again, if we do the same for the people mostly focused on ideas and concepts, Question is, is their involvement like, you know, finished when they say, now you guys deliver it? Uh, now you folks, uh, you know, code it and come back when it's ready. Uh, we, we should also see the engagement and support and feedback from these people um, on the left-hand side. So I would say I like uh, very much in, in my work to basically see, uh, yeah, once we build a system like this, where is... Um, where is uh, yeah where the engagements of the delivery people starts and also what is and how long is the engagement of the people uh, who are focused on uh, the business um yeah and that was everything what i prepared for you today i'll be happy to now walk through the questions that you have uh, so let's try to take them one by one uh, there's a question from paul i'm a scrum master am i supposed to manage and track the upstream board well, uh, as much as I remember upstream, uh, uh, as much as I remember Scrum Master uh, basically focuses on the team, the product owner and the organization. So um, I would say if you are a Scrum Master or like someone who works in the organization referring to Scrum, I don't see why the um, Scrum Master should not be the source of first of idea of visualizing the, the upstream board. Uh, definitely, if you have someone in the role of a product owner or a product manager or someone like this, I see, again, such person as this yellow shirt person here who mostly focuses on the ideas. You as a Scrum Master could, uh, I would say, uh, support such person, uh, but I, I don't see you as a Scrum Master actively moving tickets there. Yeah, but of course, um, yeah, that's, that's uh, yeah, maybe also case, case by case. Um, okay, another question from uh, Yavor about the spikes. Uh, is work on spikes considered part of the upstream? I think I partially already answered it that, uh, yeah, if the spikes are understood, understood as something that we don't commit to delivery, but maybe that's like, you know, 
prototyping, proof of concept, uh, time box investigation, I would definitely see uh, this on the upstream. Um, if you if you don't have it yet, maybe you should visualize it. Um, yeah, um, again, uh, it, it can be really that, uh, yeah, we, 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 we can track it here, we can track it on, on both boards, uh, but I would say, first of all, it, there should be agreement in the organization, where do you do it, yeah? So, um, yeah, I, I think that that's as much as I can answer uh, now. Um, okay, what else is next? Uh, who makes a decision about the whip limits for the upstream, the team members from the downstream? Uh, again, probably upstream is mostly the territory of the product uh, business people. Uh, but again, if we see a mismatch between the, the whip limits here and whip limits uh, here, I'm now referring with the mouse cursor to the upstream and downstream, uh, we will see probably some problems, right? Because again, if if uh, you will work uh, as uh, people involved on the upstream or focus on the upstream on too many items at the same time, if you will move the items in big batches, as I described, then you probably will create a huge queue be before the, the downstream ball, right? And again, you would like to see the sustainable way, uh, I would say um, something that it's, that it's balanced, yeah? Um, okay, there's one more question from Rosario. Very interesting. What is your advice about the practice uh, upstream with fast changes? Um, I know cases where, for example, uh, statuses on the upstream are the statuses showing some really quick and dirty prototyping, and uh, and and the work on the upstream is very turbulent. I don't know if that's the same what you meant by, by fast changes, but we very often say it is cheaper and healthier to in, involve also some people who can, you know, do the uh, the, the low-code, no-code prototype or, uh, or whatever else, as long as it's still on the upstream before we accept it to downstream. Yeah, some some more questions. Uh, yeah, a question assumes that it's high likely the same delivery team to work on these uh, spikes in Scrum World. They, they are like to track on the same board. Yeah, uh, well, I would say, again, you may have the same people involved or or you probably you would aim for having both uh, people, uh, both boards uh, visualizing work where the same people are involved. So if you if you imagine a situation that you know the engineering recognition or or spikes are done by totally different team or people on the upstream than the downstream, then you probably have like a big knowledge loss, right? Because one people, uh, one person or some people do it on the upstream and then they basically throw the hot potato <laughs> over the point of commitment to the delivery. I I don't think that it's uh, um, yeah good good solution. Mm. Okay, question from Stuart. Refinement being uh, upstream will obviously take time away from work already committed. Uh, what level of detail do you suggest uh -huh, to get the right balance? Um, oh my, that's a very good question. I mean, first of all, uh, I would connect it also to, I guess, the first question that we had tonight, uh, if we should have one board. Uh, first of all, we start very often from the situation where the downstream team doesn't have a way to show that they are involved on this refinement work. And uh, and therefore, I would say extending the board using the same avatars, showing that, you know, the people from this team are involved in here is a good starter. This uh, could lead to maybe a conclusion that could be behind your, your question, Stuart, like that there is imbalance, that it's like taking too much time. And of course, uh, then you need to sort it out. I'm, I'm not going to give like a silver bullet uh, <laughs> answer, um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it could trigger the right conversation. Is it okay? Is it healthy? Is it helping to deliver later faster or, or smoother if we have the people involved in the upstream? Are there different work items in the upstream compared to downstream? Uh, for example, story or epic, how do you visualize when they change type and split? 
Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, I would say we usually see that the items are becoming smaller and smaller moving across the board. So if you remember one of the one of the pictures I've shown, we could see as a part of activity on the upstream, for example, slicing, dicing the big items. And uh, maybe that's uh, if you use epics, including stories. So writing stories, creating stories for the epic could happen on the um, upstream uh, side. And then we know that mostly the teams on the downstream or delivery would focus on delivering ep like stories, which in the end uh, build up to epics. Um, maybe that's a topic for a separate webinar, because I guess in this case, we should have different levels of Kanban boards. So maybe we could have a board where we see the epics which are in preparation or epics which are in progress. And then uh, only the delivery teams takes care of the stories, tasks, or whatever is in the epics, uh, because that's maybe not as much important uh, for, I don't know, product people, because they trust that the product, that the delivery team work, um, you know, self-organizing around the work. Um, okay, there's more and more questions. I wonder what the ratio between downstream and upstream might be effective. Switching between both to some extent means switching the context. Uh-huh. Uh, when it's the same team working on upstream downstream, does it make sense to limit the combined whip limit of upstream and downstream? I like the the last sentence very much. Uh, it, it shouldn't be that you know we have like a person has two items active here and one item active here. No, I mean uh, this is again uh, I would say fooling our, either ourselves or pretending multi. Uh, multitasking. Um, so again, uh, the, first of all, upstream and downstream should reflect reality. If we see that we are unhappy with the reality, we should do something about it. Um, yeah, what if the upstream team works with Kanban and developers with Scrum? I see it fully compatible. I don't see why we couldn't uh, visualize uh, the refinement and uh, product backlog with upstream and still have the replenishment or the sprint planning, if you like, between these two boards happening regularly. Um, oh, I feel this is more advanced question. Would the service request manager, which is emerging role in Kanban, um, service request manager focus on the upstream and flow leader or service delivery manager would focus on the downstream? I would say if we have tests, this question is passed. So whoever wrote it, I would say that was... That was the, the natural choice. Um, does it make sense to have multiple discovery streams uh, by work type, uh, discovery versus technical and prototyping? Uh, mm, well, you probably, probably the author of it has some, you know, full definitions of it. I would say if we have business discovery, if we have technical discovery and prototyping, they could be statuses on the upstream. They could be swim lanes on the upstream. Yeah. So, so it really me depends on what what is understood by by these items you know, or these terms. Um, okay. If delivery system members are involved in the upstream, uh, what about their personal whip limits? Should they be identified for upstream and downstream separately? I believe we already answered it. We we cannot focus on <laughs> too many items. Uh, and if we extend the board again, the personal whip limit should be, uh, yeah, probably the same and respected. Uh, if I'm in Scrum, do I? How do I visualize upstream on the sprint board? Uh, difficult with Jira, I guess. Uh, not really, Hannah. I would say I know cases where we have, uh, yeah, extended workflows in the same uh, project, and we just consider as a part of the Scrum downstream some of the uh, statuses and some of the statuses are let's just say um what's the right word uh booked or uh for for the upstream work right uh so it it is possible in in tools like jira to to have it uh then we have the sprint board but maybe we visualize different the items in the in the upstream or the backlog Okay, um, how does Kanban compare to safe flow? Oh, um, I, I, I think I mentioned that, that if you work in safe, if you have like a big quarterly uh, or five sprints planning, like PI planning, uh, maybe that's something that you would visualize to uh, on, on the upstream. 
and still have the uh, regular sprints. If you have sprints, because say if you also have like Kanban teams or work teams without fixed cadences um, on the downstream, um, is there is in the general part of the system stable enough in order to be useful tracking metrics? Um, yeah, I mean. Uh, Again, I would start with the discovery work. I would start with putting the items into the right uh, columns. If we see the good flow, if we see the depth of the flow, um, then we, of course, can do something about it. Um, I will also refer to one of the pictures that I have shown before, that um, if you see that the speed on the upstream and downstream are so significantly different, uh, then it is probably a kind of uh, warning, right? That uh, it's very slow in here and very fast in here. Um, and uh, that's probably something that you would like to, yeah, talk about between, you know, people responsible, focused on uh, both sides. Okay, that was the last question. It's almost on time, almost in one hour. We are just in time, Anya. <laughs> yes, we are. Thank you very much, Radek. You were very, very efficient in answering these questions. Probably yeah. to, for me, it would take one hour or more. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thanks to all attendees who decided to spend time with us uh, today evening or day, again, wherever you are. And thanks for all of these questions. I also learned some new things from uh, all of you, from the questions and from the answers. So yeah. thanks a lot for that. A recording will be available for you in a few days. And if you still have any questions, please drop them at info at dja.com. Thank you very much, Radek, one more time. And see you soon at another webinar. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.